Tonight you'll hear about how your brain decides where the failure uh, can creep in when you're out free flying and what you might be able to do about it. The topic of, of this evening is going to be about the psychology of flight and uh, we have Mr Matt Harrison to present it. Um, for those of you who haven't met Matt, he's been on a uh, rather long sabbatical from the club in the, in the UK for the last five years, but uh, yeah, he's been a, a long time uh, paraglider pilot and also a, uh, an organisational psychologist, I guess you could say, with um, originally with the, the Navy here in New Zealand. but. Uh, He's got a lot of insights that I think is, are going to be really useful to um, potentially how we approach the sport and, and how we should think about the mental side of it. So uh, without further ado, I'd just like to get everyone to, to welcome Matt. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Graham, and hello everyone who I haven't seen for a, a long time and obviously lots of new faces. Um, Tonight's going to be a very thin slice of psychology. <laughs> There's a lot in psychology that we could apply to our, our sport of flying. Um, so a little bit um, more about me, just so you can get an understanding of um, who I am and, and why I'm standing up in front of you. Um, I did 10 years in the Navy as an occupational organizer. I say occupational now, but that's British, so organizational psychology um, psychologist. Um, and we had lots of roles uh, there, lo lots of functions, supporting um, the people function and, and getting people ready to go and do what they do overseas and come back um, and do it as well and as safe and as confidently um, as they can. Um, one of the small pieces of that job was about human factors. So if you've done any kind of aviation, um, maybe with the exception of paragliding, uh, you would have done some kind of human factors training at some point um, within your qualification. What we did in the Navy is we took human factors off the flight deck um, and away from our buddies in the Air Force and we implemented it on the bridge of warships. Um, and that's a, a journey that we tried to take um, for culture change and for safety and for performance um, on the bridge of warships around a multi-crew environment that I'll tell, I could tell, an, I'll tell another day, it's not for tonight, but that was the um, the experience of, of applying human factors um, in an environment such as that. And it's also very applicable to what we do. Tonight's talk is going to be as much framed on outdoor sports as it is on paragliding. Um, I've spent over the various years, 10 to 12 years, very intensely um, scuba diving. I was a, or still am I guess, but not active, a scuba diving instructor. I, um, worked in the industry and we got quite heavily into tech deep and wreck diving. Um, so thinking about how it works there. Um, I've done some mountain biking out of everything that I've done or do. Um, stand fast the motorcycle. Mountain biking is by far the most dangerous. Um, so <laughs> um, with all the trees and, and rocks and stuff. Um, and I've done Quite a lot of rock climbing. I wouldn't call myself a, a great rock climber, but I did it every week for probably three or four years, and we went um, in the gym and went outside quite a bit. And then I got a little bit into alpine. Um, and we'll come back to, to the rock and alpine in, um, a bit later on in, in the evening as well. So tonight is going... Oh, and I've flown since uh, paraglider since 2006. Um, pretty much nothing in the last five years except for one national comp that I was happened to be home for. Um, and so I would call myself um, a long time low air time pilot. <laughs> if, that, if that makes any sense at all. Um, tonight's sort of a little bit unapologetically going to have some theory involved. Um, so I'll ask you to embrace the thinking um, as, we, as we talk about some of the uh, cognitive science uh, that is giving way to neuroscience now in, in the research that applies to us um, when we're out there in the world doing our thing. So a little bit on how your brain makes decisions um, 
a little bit about where the failure can come in and then a little bit about what you can do about it. So largely this is sitting in the, in the safety realm, um, but if you want to talk a bit more, push that a bit further forward, it's like, okay, if we want to push ourselves right to the, to the limit and operate at the edge of um, our kind of risk envelope, then we start to talk about performance as well. And those were the conversations we'd have with helicopter crew or, or, or warship drivers about how they can operate right to the edge of their risk envelope without going over it. Um, which they also did sometimes. Um, and then if they did, how do, can we try to make sure that they fail safe, which is a concept we'll talk about tonight as well. Um, who's heard of Thinking Fast and Slow the book, anyone? Yep, so a few people have heard about it. So uh, Daniel Kahneman was uh, or is a um, behavioral econo uh, economist and psychologist and he did a lot of research on this kind of stuff in the 60s and 70s. Um, along with his, his uh, research partner, and the book's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And for a lay audience like us, he split our, our thinking processes up into, into two categories. The neuroscience doesn't agree that they're not categories, the brain just does its thing. Um, but for our, for the, for our um, purposes tonight, we're going to run with two uh, systems. So system one is fast thinking. Okay. System one is automatic, it's involuntary, it's quick, it's effortless, it's predictive. Okay. So your brain is fast thinking all of the time. It is running scripts um, unconscious or subconsciously, and it's making predictions. And then when the stimuli reach um, the receptors, so whether that's your retinas or your eardrums or something, what's actually happening is your brain is sending out the predictions to the site of the, to the stimuli, so to the end of the optical nerve for sight, and if the stimuli that's coming in matches what the expectation is, all the brain activity stops. It doesn't need to take it any further, which is, psh, what? <laughs> okay, if it doesn't match, then the brain's like, oh, I better have that into my cognitive thinking um, areas and work out what the hell's going on, okay? So it doesn't even get all the way in because the expect so we're ex the expectation is, is what precedes it. And those expectations are built around a whole bunch of things, including genetics um, and any experience that we have, um, and certainly training um, and practice um, and expertise as we build into things like paradigm. Here's another couple examples um, of how you can see um, fast thinking working. So, who's seen the Muller Lai illusion before? Most people? Okay. Even though you know it's an illusion, even though you know that those lines are the same size, your brain still tells you um, that, they are, that one is longer than the other, right? It's what you're looking at it going, okay, so it's being tricked, even though you know. And the same with the, the monsters, right? The monsters are the same size too. Does anyone need to come up and measure them with, <laughs> with, with hand spans to make sure that I'm not lying? Okay. Okay. You're like, what? No, they're not. It's way smaller, the one in the front. Okay, they're the same. So your brain's doing this stuff with, with running the expectation scripts all the time. And we're going to come to why that's important in a bit. So the next thing I want you to do is I want you to tell me what 17 times 24 is. Like, no, I actually want you to tell me what 17 times 24 is. 420, 402, 428? 408. 408, okay. 408. So what did you have to do to, to work this one out? <laughs> I'm not really interested in the, the actual mathematical, mathematical method that you took. What I'm interested in is the fact that it was what? It was, stopping. It was effortful. You had to make a conscious decision to apply cognitive effort and attention and do slow thinking in order to come up with that answer. Okay? So that's, that's a system two. So stuff that requires attention to fix co or to solve complex problems um, that needs you to be deliberate and discretionary about um, is system two. So are you happy with the feeling of the difference between system one and system two, yeah? That's our first point today. System two helps, complements, and checks system one. 
So the person who came up with uh, 10 cents and then goes 10 cents plus a dollar, uh, that's a dollar 10. Oh no, it can't, it can't be that. And um, what is it? It's 105, five, five cents. If you did that, you're using slow thinking to check and rein in fast thinking to make sure it doesn't do dumb stuff by yelling out 10 cents. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> okay, system two is lazy though. You need to have effort. You need to apply effort um, in order for system two to do something. So the neuroscience, which I'm still reading as it's coming off the press and have recently become a deeper student of because of some work stuff that I'm involved in, <laughs> suggests the whole, um, the, brain, the brain is firing all the time. Yeah. It's doing stuff all the time. Um, in the, uh, in a, in, even in a, in a latent mode, it's doing everything. It's running all its predictions. It's firing and all. And the old sort of understanding of the, the prefrontal cortex being totally different from a system from your, your reptile brain and your, and your um, animalian brain and the, and the fight flight coming out of this and the not, is sort, sort of being disproved out of, like, out of the, um, the neuroscience, that they are separate entities, not that fight or flight is not a thing, because we, we know that it is. And the one last thing of system two is when we're using system two, the cognitive load and attention goes on to that, um, and we can become blind to the other stimuli coming in. Okay? So who remembers what it was like learning to drive when they were 15 or 16 in the car? System one or system two doing the driving when you were 15 and your first time in the car? System two. Were you able to hold a conversation with somebody else in the car while you were learning to drive when system two was doing the driving? Still can't. Still can't. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were screaming. <laughs> right? Um, system one is probably, hopefully, doing most of the driving for you now um, because it passes into automaticity. Um, and so through practice and training, and we can run um, mental schema without needing all of the cognitive effort that system two brings. That's concept one. Concept two is about decision making. And this is, this is real big handfuls. Um, there's two different ways we make decisions. One is an analytical or intentional, and it, and it largely uses system two to do it. Don't worry too much about... Um, this on the side, but basically system analytical decision making means getting a whole lot of alternatives, looking at all the pros and cons and analyzing each one and working out which one is going to be the best option, choosing that and then go doing it, okay? Analytical decision making. It's probably what you use if you're someone who goes and looks at all the specs before you buy your next computer and runs them all out and tries to weigh them up against each other and goes, okay, I'm gonna do that. That's analytical decision making. The other type of decision making that we can use is called recognition primed decision making and it's got lots of other names, automatic, naturalistic, or intuitive. And it's much more system one that's doing that type of decision making. And it's used best by experts. So what we do is we experience a situation and then subconsciously, the cues allow us to recognize patterns, allow us to run scripts, which then means we assess by simulating very quickly based on a whole lot of basic um, scenario cards that we have in our experiential memory. Right? So if you imagine you're a captain of a warship and something happens, Someone goes over the side, or there's an incoming missile, and the captain just goes, do this. He doesn't really know how he got to that, or how she got to that, but just does it. And the idea of this is that you use the first OK option, the first option that's going to be 80% good that you can go and do fast. The initial research where they came up for this model is really interesting. Does anybody know who they were doing the research with when they, when they found out about this automatic or naturalistic decision making? I'm looking at you, Evan, do you know? Uh, we've had a lot of training in RCD, but I don't know where it came from. Firefighters. Firefighters, okay. And so they were on the fire ground, and they asked firefighters how they made decisions when, um, particularly the scene leaders, how they made decisions as to how 
where they put their crews and every, everything, and the guy goes, we don't make any decisions, we just do. Yep. And the researchers are going, you're making decisions all the time, I can see it. And they're like, no, we don't. And they're like, mm, back to the drawing board, we don't understand this. Um, and what the firefighters were doing were feature matching. So they'd go into it, and um, scene leaders, when they're going into a room, the classic is they went into, they would go in, the classic example is they went in and they're like, okay, everybody out, something's wrong. Um, and they didn't know what, and then the floor collapsed because the heat was coming from the, a different place from what their mental model suggests it should, given what everything else they knew. So. And so you saw that, and you see it in the military um, with experts, and you also you do see it in, um, in adventure sports with the experts too, with the way that they react in different scenarios. So if you're flying along, and you're, and you're on glide, and you're trying to find the next thermal, most of us lay people are busy thinking about the star system we're taught and trying to count stars of one for other paragliders and one for a dark object and one for the wind and one for the... Blah, blah. Meanwhile, Jeff's just like, I'm going there. And you're like, hey, Jeff, why? And he's like, me. <laughs> <laughs> Off he goes. <laughs> right? By training and practicing, you're, you're moving more... Um, of the skill set into automatic from, from the psychomotor view and removing it out of the system too so that you've got more cognitive attention available to deal with novel situations um, that you're not with and then, the, and then the, the practice on different scenarios gives you these cues, yeah. We always used to say there's expert decision making, they use naturalistic or automatic and there's novice decision making and they are forced to use analytical but you're like well when do you become an expert? It's just like there's just this graduated scale as you build up, and then some scenarios you'll be you'll be have enough expertise, and others you won't, and it's like that. But it's getting an understanding, and the next slide will help us know as we're breaking down the thinking as to what we would do differently, given a different scenario. So the first takeaway is the brain processes a shit ton of information all the time, okay? But we can't deal with all of the stimuli. There's petabytes of equivalent information coming in all the time that would just cut, so the brain just gets rid of everything that it doesn't need um, and runs all the predictive scripts in order for us, for us to just be able to function. And then when we need system two, we come and we concentrate on something and then we, we get it done, okay? Most of the time, you know, almost all of the time, those predictive scripts are working for us, not against us. The situation that we want to talk about tonight is when do those predictive scripts and that expertise and our experience start getting in the way um, and start causing us to have some issues? One of the things that I've found really useful um, in understanding how human failure can happen um, is this taxonomy of human error, or this description of human error here. So we've got two, there's got two ways that we can get through to a failure or an unsafe act happening. Let's deal with violation first. Violation is intentional and deliberate. We are at least somewhat aware that we are committing a violation when we're doing it. And by that nature, it's a social construct. Okay? It's driven by incentives um, and social um, and ways that we rationalize things. So who drives their car around the streets at 50 kilometers an hour everywhere always? Who kind of at least, at least 10 or more years ago anyway, just sat on 60 all the time. <laughs> Who still does? My question to you is why? Why are you comfortable sitting at 60 kilometers an hour? We can leave that as a rhetorical question if you want. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why do we sit at 60? No, in a, yeah, in a 50 zone for sure, yeah. It's pretty much the same. Okay, so there's a social rationalization right there. Everyone else is doing it. Not judging that, but that is, that's what that is. And sure, yep. I've been hit from behind when I was doing the speed limit. Don't like that. Yep, okay. Another one? Just because it's unsafe. Because you don't think it's unsafe. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay. So we disagree with the rule, so we just... So what we're talking about there is what? Routine, that's a routine violation. What's one routine violation we make um, in flying, in paragliding all the time? Going into clouds. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of hope not. <laughs> I hope that would be more exceptional <laughs> for some pilots, maybe. We make another routine violation all the time, routinely, 
without worrying about it, without even probably being conscious of us doing it. Decisions of flight? No. Flying without um, the instrumentation at the coast? Yeah. Pretty standard one. That's it. <laughs> That's the one that comes. Flying without an altimeter at the coast or any gauges at the coast. It's illegal. But we don't care. <laughs> Why? Why don't we care? Again, rhetorical if you want. <laughs> because we believe we have a built-in altimeter, our eyes. Yeah, we're not. Why do we need an altimeter at Cario, right? The, the so airspace is miles above us, far enough that we're not going to get in the thermal and get in it, and I'm close to the ridge, and I'm, I, don't, I don't need an altimeter, but technically that's a routine violation. So a, a situational violation is where you, com uh, you commit a violation based on quite a unique set of circumstances around a... Um, situation and an exception is when you'd only do it that time because of something else has happened. So they're all kind of, right. they're slight differences, but they've got the same thing. What's more interesting to us tonight is error. Error is by definition unintentional. Okay, so when we, when we make an error, we didn't mean to do that. Okay, and there's two types. Um, in big buckets. Um, one is about skill-based areas of execution, um, and the other one is about areas of, thi uh, areas of thinking which, is making mis which we call mistakes. So we've got slips and lapses sit over an execution. A lapse, sorry, a slip is when we do something wrong, but with the correct intention. So I intend to do the right action, but I carry it out wrong. I'll give you an example in a minute. A lapse is when we intend to do the correct action, but we carry it out wrong by forgetting a step. Launching without your leg straps done up, um, with the intent of launching with them done up, because we generally have that intent, is a lapse. It's, a, it's an error in, of skill in, as a lapse. Okay? Thinking errors are mistakes are knowledge or rule-based. So a, a rule-based um, mistake might be committed by an expert in a novel scenario where they're applying a rule that they know of, and they, um, but the rule doesn't apply to that situation because the situation is different. It's not what they're expecting to see for some reason. Okay. Um, knowledge base is when you don't know the correct, the correct thing to do, so you do the wrong thing. Okay. So I'll give you an example. This is one I used to use in the military, so forgive the, the nature of it. So on the table, I've got a fork and a Glock 7, if that makes any sense to you, okay, a pistol. Um, and then a bad guy comes into the room, okay? If I pick up the fork and throw it at the bad guy when he's about to, to be, um, fire at me, what have I done? I've lost a fork. I've made him... <laughs> I've made a mistake <laughs> in thinking that my action, and even if I throw it and hit him dead on, I haven't made um, a slip, or I haven't, I've, I've done what I intended to do correctly. It's a knowledge, knowledge based mistake. If I pick up the pistol and fire it and pull the trigger and nothing happens because the safety catch is still on, what have I done? Yep. Yeah. And if I quickly flick the safety catch up and I shoot at him and I miss, what have I done? Slip. Right, okay. So now if you understand that, how do we fix these problems? Yeah. So I can teach people the right thing to do if they're faced with an enemy and they have a firearm and a fork. Okay, so I can, <laughs> can fix the mistake. Okay, so I can give them the knowledge. So if we start to understand this and then we start to think about some of the years we the human error that occurs when we're out in the field flying paragliders, we can, uh, we can start to understand some of the things that we would do in order to try and stop these from happening in the future. Okay? Um, how would we stop ourselves from launching with our leg straps undone? We have a checklist. Where do you think the checklist came from? Is it system one or system two that does a checklist? System two. And what, is, what do we know about system two? It's effortful. What happens if we get distracted on launch by a man with a camera? We start our checklist again. Hopefully. But if we get too distracted and the cognitive attention goes somewhere else, 
and I forget to return to my checklist, I might launch with my leg straps undone. So the scenario that I'm going to talk about now, so we're going to put all of these into context, um, and we'll talk about what happened there, and then we're going to pull it back to, to paragliding after that, because we're going to leave paragliding briefly. So the second takeaway is you're fallible and you make error all the time. After learning that last thing about slips and lapses, I caught myself doing slips and lapses and mistakes all the time. All the time, every day. You watch yourself. Forgot to do this piece. Um, I intended to walk out with, um, into the garage and, and onto the car with all the stuff that I needed, which was my wallet, my keys, my phone, my this, and then I get to the car and I'm like, I don't have my phone. Fail, problem, problem there? No, not a problem. I'll go back and get my phone, no issue. It fails safe, but it's error. That's human error, okay? And we do that all the time, every day, because we are fallible humans living in a really complex world. Okay, so just let that sink in. And then, after you leave, go and start watching yourself commit mistakes and lapses and slips. Because you'll start to see them as you draw your attention to them. Right, I'm gonna, now we're gonna have a scenario. So this is a real scenario, um, and if you recognize it, um, Hopefully it's not too close to the bone for you. And I'm going to read it, because I wrote it um, the other day, and reading it is going to work better for me. So, on the afternoon of 25th of October 2013, 16 members of the Auckland section of the New Zealand Alpine Club left Auckland on the club's annual Labour Weekend trip to Mount Taranaki. The initial destination for the drive was North Egmont Visitor Centre. They started off Auckland, once there, they had a two and a half hour walk up to Taharangi Lodge where they would spend the night. Some left Auckland mid afternoon while others didn't get away until the early evening, uh, leaving Auckland for the long weekend. Oh, sorry, when traffic leaving Auckland for the long weekend was horrible. Parties arrived at the lodge from 9 pm through to 2 am. I've been on Auckland section trips before, I used to climb with them quite a lot not to Taranaki, but mostly to Ruapehu, um, and to various rock crags, on countless other trips like that, on scuba diving, mountain biking, and paragliding as well. So experience tells me that the spirits and a sense of excitement about the next day's activities would have been high, and walking up to the hut after dark, after a long after work drive was routine, particularly at Ruapehu and the, Auckland, uh, the, Auckland, uh, sorry, the Alpine Club hut um, up above the um, top of the Bruce there. Really common activity. In the morning, the 16 climbers became one group of six who left to climb via the North Ridge, while the remaining 10 set off to tackle the significantly more technical East Ridge and then descend after summiting via the North Ridge, so the easier route down. The North Ridge team summited about 11.45 in the morning and spent 45 minutes there before heading down. Conditions at the start of the day were warm, bright and clear, but climbing was hard due to a covering of ice. Climbers spent a lot of time front pointing on all fours with ice tools. By midday on the summit, the forecast wind had started to rise and it had become pretty cold. The group descended and were back at Tahirangi by 3.45 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, on the East Ridge, the going had been considerably slower and more difficult. The team was of mixed experience and while there were two club instructors with them, they were acting in a participant only capacity, or so those instructors believed. When the slopes steepened on the upper reaches, the team started pitching for additional safety, so that's using ropes to, to go up the ice slope. It transpired that some of the members had little or no experience roping up steep alpine terrain, and the group only had enough rope for three rope teams, meaning they needed to sit and wait for belays. Additionally, two ropes were only 35 metres long, which for alpine is really short, um, and, not well, and therefore not well suited for alpine pitching because they make it really slow. The slow pace and the waiting around meant several of the climbers started to get really cold. The two instructors conferred and decided to ask some of the more confident people to come off the belay to speed up the process. One pair did so and moved away up the mountain solo, which means no ropes. While the two instructors also came off rope but remained with the other six helping out as they pitched up the mountain. Progress on the ropes was painfully slow. 
Two roped groups formed, and they moved, but they moved apart with one slightly lower than the other, the faster one getting slightly above and off to the right. No one checked the time, and no one looked at the weather. The original pair who had moved away solo by this time, a little while later, had summited and had come back down to the, to the lower of the two groups. They reported that on the summit the wind was thumping so hard we couldn't stand, and that looking west it looked like hell on earth advancing a ma mass of black chasing the white wisps already wrapping the mountain. The weather report was this weather report was confronting and the team was shocked to find it was now also after 4 p.m. in the afternoon. When he was interviewed later, that instructor of that who was with the lower group said he thought it was about 12.30. That instructor who was with the lower group, lower group took charge and decided they needed to turn around. They shouted their intentions across to the other team to the right who were surprised by this, given that they were only 120 metres below the summit. They didn't relay the summiter's weather report to them. The second group had just crossed a particularly steep and exposed area and they didn't want to backtrack across it. They continued for the summit and the access to the safer and easier Northridge descent. Going backwards down the, sleep, the steep east ridge was slow, but as that group descended, they got more and more protected from the westerly weather and the slope eventually backed off. When they arrived late at the lodge, they expected to find the others there after their Northridge descent. They weren't. When those remaining four reached the crater rim, they were struck by the full force of the storm. They couldn't find the normal route and had to rappel into the crater to gain access to the Northridge track. By now the wind was whipping the ropes vertical and rime ice was forming on every surface. When they reached the crater it was 8pm and dark and they were tired and very, very cold. Does anyone know how this story ends? Yeah. This story does not have a good ending. Through various mechanisms and mishaps, the four were separated into two pairs, and while one headed down, the other chose to dig in on the mountain, still at 2,500 metres. Uh, sorry, 2,400 metres, about 150 metres below the summit. Both pairs spent the first night on the mountain in shallow scrapes that barely protected them. On Sunday, the lower pair walked out, even though one of them had an ankle injury but the higher pair were unable to do so because of the weather and their condition. They were both hypothermic. The rescue teams couldn't get to them on the Sunday, and ultimately neither of them survived the second night. There's a lot of biases or heuristic traps along the way, and there is, and it is a beautiful example in hindsight for looking at those, so thanks Evan, and we're about to do that. Yeah, it's a beautiful example from the safety of this room to talk about what went wrong, and I'll talk in a second about how and how we will do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So decision making and risk taking and risk versus reward. That's an interesting one because they were not conscious of any risk taking. They were not conscious of any decisions that were turning out to be bad ones because that's not the space they were in at the moment. So the reason why I chose this was because this could be any of us. This was just a group of people on a fairly low level alpine climb, yes, or, or walk in the mountains on a labour weekend. Um, you know, we see these things in the news and we think they're all these, you know, high, you know, skilled climbers doing crazy stuff. These were just a bunch. Um, Hiroki was 31, Nicole was 29. They happened to be a couple, may or may not have contributed to the decision making in the, in the mountain as well. Um, but they didn't, they didn't do anything stupid, and yet they made tons of mistakes. So what is, what is that? And so that is the, that's the question that we want to have a discussion about now. What does heuristic mean? Heuristic is the, is the mental models, so we'll get there in a second. So the, these are the first, so, so a heuristic is a mental model that we have in our minds um, that system one uses to make decisions and in, in that um, the way of how it automatically comes up with those decisions. 
um, but there's a lot of bias that can get in our way if the, if the environment that we think we're in doesn't match the environment that we're using to make the decisions. Okay? Um, so we'll talk about that. Before we get into it, I want to talk about hindsight and looking back on an event like that. Because there's two heuristics that trap us now, well, almost all of us, if we're not aware of them. The first one is hindsight bias. I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. You idiots, the outcome effect. Okay, so the, the hindsight bias is about um, overestimating the predictability of an outcome once you know what that outcome is. And the, and the outcome effect is about judging the participants once you knew that the outcome was negative. So we can say, I knew they were going to get stuck in that weather because they knew the weather was coming. I knew that wasn't a good idea. Those guys are idiots. Okay? So that's committing those two biases. If you want to understand what went wrong in an event like this, you need to get inside the minds of the people who were doing it. And the basic example is, did the, when, you, when you witness a, a, an airplane crash and you ask yourself, did the pilot intend to crash the aircraft? No. So what was going on for her at the time that caused her to do the behaviours that ended up in that event coming out of it? What was going on for these guys on the mountain at the time that caused them to do the behaviours that ended up with that outcome that they sure as heck weren't predicting? Okay. What was going on for us at the time when we decided to push for goal even though that thunderhead was getting pretty close. Okay, that's the, um, and then everyone else on the ground's looking up going, what an idiot. Okay. So the, the trap in those as well is that you distance yourself from making the same mistakes. You go, oh, I wouldn't do that, I'm not that stupid. Absolutely, yeah. Inherent in this, it wouldn't have happened to me. Yeah, yeah. you don't learn anything out of yeah. it. So the, Hindsight cannot explain why that behavior occurred. Th this hindsight, looking back. Because we start to do things like the what-ifs, the they should-haves, um, the they, shouldn't, they should have done this, they shouldn't have done that, they should have known the weather, they should have had a turnaround time, they should have got off the mountain. None of those things happen on that day. They're called counterfactuals, and they're useless for explaining why they made the decisions that they did. We can learn by looking back, though, in hindsight and understanding how some of these things affected them and then put, into, put mechanisms into place so that they don't affect us later. So we can do that. So that's your point at the bottom, Evan. Right, yeah, it absolves us. We, it wouldn't have been me. Um, okay. So here's a little bit more information so now we've talked about hindsight, I'll put the weather maps up for you. Okay, so this is Friday. You can see there's a cold front going through on Friday. You guys are all happy with the weather, your paraglider pilots. Okay, so that's a cold front going on Friday, and um, the map on that side is 12 p.m. Saturday. So what can you, you see so that it's, it's clear? The weather on Saturday was good. They knew they had that window. There's emails in the accident reports between Hiroki, who died, and Rowan, who was the other instructor, um, who was the guy that um, decided they needed to turn around and go back down. Okay? And they talked on emails on the Thursday morning about what the weather was looking for, looking like. Weather on, uh, weather on the weekend looks pretty bad. It looks like we'll have a window on Saturday morning as long as we get off the top by midday. Sunday looks terrible we might be able to get back up for a play on Monday morning. That's what the emails said. That's what the emails said. Okay. Then the emails went on to say something along the lines of, most of the guys have already paid a deposit. I'm not sure if they'll be able to get refunded. I'm pretty sure we can get some time on the mountain out of it. Let's still go. Outcome effect. <laughs> um, 
This is 352 on Saturday, taken by one of the individuals who ended up being part of one of the rescue uh, crews. What that scenario didn't talk about is what happened afterwards, and then how the, res the, the rescues was, was, was not executed well either, and may or may not have contributed to them not being able to get off. There's, it is your classic error chain with failure after failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. It's a perfect test case for looking at this, but we're only going to talk up to the point where they decided to go their split, split ways. So that's the weather from the east side. They knew the weather was coming from the west, and they knew that the, that the well, they would have known at least theoretically when they weren't on the mountain, let's put it like that, that the north ridge was going to be way more exposed than the east ridge. It would be very easy for us right now to say they should have known that. Let's say at some point before they were on the mountain, they would have known that theoretically. And then that's a weather map from Sunday. There is reports from the rescue guys that they'd only seen conditions on the mountain like that two or three times in the last 50 years. Really? Yeah. The map doesn't, the map doesn't really show that um, at all. <laughs> but the actual conditions of the day, um, I mean, if you want to read the, if you want to read the reports, it's, it's, it's horrendous. <laughs> no, not the weather report, the uh, accident reports. So they had, um, Rowan and another guy went back up on the Saturday night to try and get to them. They were forced off the mountain. Um, a rescue crew went up early on the Saturday morning. They were forced off the mountain. And then crews were forced off the mountain all day Sunday. Um, Air Force tried to get a Huey in. They couldn't. Um, and they probably should have had a civilian helicopter because the Air Force Hueys and just the technology is not such for that kind of rescue. Um, and they didn't, and there's all sorts of issues around the rescue, but that's not what we're talking about now. Okay. What do you think the, what do you think, this is really interesting too, what do you think the um, accident report um, recorded as the, as the cause? So this is what the accident report says. Ultimately, it was their own decision to continue with the climb and the subsequent bivouac that caused their deaths. Whose accident report is this? Who, who? So there were two. One was done by, uh, um, one was commissioned by the Alpine Com itself, which was by two, um, they call it independent externals, but they're long time climbers, club members, safety people. And then the other one was the coroner's report, um, which is, but they're both very aligned in the, in the content. So, Johnny, you just said it before. What's this our equivalent of? The pilot error. Or, yeah. yeah. Pilot error. <laughs> pilot error. Who buys this, having heard the first half of this talk? Well, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, sure, it was pilot error. Um, but what caused the pilot error? And how can we think about doing things differently? So what do we mean by pilot, by, by, um... No, no, I'm confused because you said who buys this, who buys So I'm asking who thinks that this is a good enough, ex um, well, cause of it, death? It's good enough, but obviously it was by error. It's kind of done and dusted, isn't it? It doesn't quite explain. No, that's my point. It yeah, says, okay. so basically they did all this investigation and came up with that sentence. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in there about heuristic traps or biases or human factors or the lead up to the things and all of the decision points that they went through. There's nothing. There was a whole bunch of recommendations which the Alpine Club has, has taken and implemented as well. Um, but this was, the, they, they drilled it right down to this one, literally one sentence. Um, and I feel like there's more to be, there's, there's more, <laughs> there's more. We do a disservice to, to accept a report that blames pilot error. Certainly it used to be easy for airlines to blame pilot error and, and not the systems and the culture in which those pilots lived and worked, um, for sure. Um, some slash most are better than that now. So I've done a second map. 
So I just want to take you through, this is not all of the decision points. So cancelling the trip, oh you can't read it up there, I'll read them out. Cancelling the trip due to weather was broadly discussed. Okay, it was discussed, it was a thing. Should we go, should we not? Um, it may or may not surprise you to hear that the Wellington section of the, of the New Zealand Alpine Club were going to Taranaki that weekend too and they binned it. Didn't go near the mountain. So I'm gonna add a bunch of extra information now that we understand the hindsight um, effect. Okay, so once they, got to the, um, once they got to the hut, they went to bed after two o'clock in the morning. Um, and Rowan had said, if you're going to the East Ridge, you need to be out the door at 5.30. If you're going to the North Ridge, you need to be out the door at 6.30. No one went out the door until 7.45, and they all left together. You may or, they may or may not have had tiredness and fatigue as an issue. We don't know the individuals. We don't know how many Red Bulls they drank that morning. We don't know how well their bodies respond to Red Bull. Um, we do know that most of them didn't go to bed till two o'clock and had driven from Auckland the night before. Um, they had no planning discussion in the morning. They had a haphazard allocation of people to teams. They didn't talk about equipment. Some people left ropes behind because they didn't think they'd need them. And people jumped from the North Ridge group to the East Ridge group at the very last minute. And they didn't really talk about the differences in the technicality and the difficulty of the two routes. And they certainly didn't think about how the clear weather that day after a cold front yesterday might have affected the icing on the mountain everywhere, um, which made it very hard because it was very, very um, solid ice under, underfoot. Okay, and then, so let's have a look at some of the decision points. Oh, there was no group leader. Um, and yet there was two instructors in the East Ridge crew, both of which who had toured on a snowcraft course the previous winter, half of the people who were on that trip had been on the snowcraft course. So they believe there is instructors on this trip. And that comes out in the accident report. Um, they did ad hoc team um, reallocations on the way up the, on the cliff. So I've just put a whole lot of things up. We'll just read them out from here. So they did ad hoc team reallocations as they were going up. Um, the progress was slow, and yet they weren't looking at the weather or checking the watch. Think about system one versus system two and cognitive overload and distraction and fear and cold. Um, they were getting cold, so that's taking bodily resources um, away from their cognitive machinery to make good decisions as well. Um, the summiters came back from the top um, and gave the information that they had from the top, but the crew that went up didn't hear it. Um, so there was a miscommunications to, to team two. So there's all of these things, if you had conscious checkpoints or, or things to look out for or had briefed earlier that you might have seen, that might have gone, okay, this is taking too, this is taking too long, what does that mean? What's the weather doing? What are we seeing coming over the top? None of that was spoken of all the way up. And so I reckon there's at least 10 decision points where they could have made a different decision and this thing wouldn't have happened. At least 10. Between the decision for them to, to when they split, it wasn't even decision. When Rowan left, he just assumed Hiroki was going to follow and he didn't. And Rowan is probably to this day, I haven't spoken to him for a long time, very, very angry. But Hiroki didn't make that decision. He, he won't have, he'd tell you he won't have made it. He would, they would just kept on, on with the plan. Okay. So let's take it back into things that might have been contributing to this. So now this is just Matt's list. This is not based on um, this Thing, particularly and we're starting to pull it back into the things that we would start to think about when we're flying. And I agree from a, like mountain climbing is also great for these examples is because it's pulled out over long periods of time, whereas we are only in the air for a much shorter period of time and, and we make a much more acute weather-based decision. 
Um, so our era chains are likely to be stacked a lot closer in time than, than it playing out over three days like this did, but it gives us more luxury to see all those decision points playing out. So what are some of the things that might get in the way of the sound, sound decision making in those types of scenarios? Ours, theirs, Vince. Tequila shots. Yeah, yeah. Sleep, yep. The long drive and the money they spent. Yep. Ego. Ego, yep. Culture of not using risk reduction measures. Yeah, um, and whether that's a culture, y yes, but possibly without the judgment that f could have been inferred in, in stating it like that. So a, a practice of, an a, a, a ignorance of the need to, just didn't know, wasn't a practice of, but yes, agree. Yep, so there's a heuristic in there which we'll talk about, but yep, for sure. Yeah. Fear. Hold that thought. Yes, I don't think that the summit was a draw. I don't think they were trying to bag the summit that day. Um, Hiroki had climbed Taranaki four times before, um, Hiroki was the most genuine, most um, generous, fun, coolest guy ever. He wasn't, in fact, we think that contributed to his decision to not get off the mountain and, um, and do what he did to try and save Nicole. That didn't work in the end, um, including putting his body between the wind and her um, to, to protect her from the, the there's, there's a whole lot of stuff. He also controlled the rappel into the crater to the point that if he hadn't have done it with the precision and the skill that he'd done it, none of them would have even got as far as they did, all four of them. So, but, so I don't think they were trying to bag the, the summit. I do think they were trying to get on that north ridge, and I don't think they wanted to go back down the east ridge because it's scary to go up, let alone back down, um, especially in those icing conditions. So illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, eating. Who's seen that before? What's a, what do we know that as? I'm safe. I'm safe. I, this is our aviation. This is the extent of private pilot aviation human factors. Um, thereabouts. Well, you'd be pleased to know we've finally introduced it to the NZHGPA. Who's yeah. <laughs> year one syllabus? I rang up Eva the other day and said, can you send me the human factor stuff that's in the PG1 and PG2? And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh. <coughs> so I'm mixing up my previous aviation stuff. I thought... I'm safe as in there. I'm safe as in there. Yeah, okay. So tequila shots is in I'm safe, for sure. Um, fatigue is in there, so something they could have thought about, potentially. Um, illness and medication, all of these things are going to use up bodily energy and cognitive resources. Okay, that's basically what we're talking about here. What else might get in the way? So to your point, Johnny, the social factors, okay, the norms and the rules and the cultures, to your point as well, Andy, um, around just what we do, expectations around what the other group is expecting of me as a group member, um, potentially expectations of making the summit or to the North Ridge, yeah. Yeah, so scenario, adverse um, event scenario planning. We'll talk a little bit about that as what you can do, yeah. But this, the, the, the final point, the heuristic traps, and we'll look at those because that's kind of the, the crux of it. Novel scenarios. Um, one of the other things I forgot to mention in the email was Hiroki had said the weather looks about the same as it was last year. So he had a mental schema of what the mountain looked like the year before. Hiroki did not, he was a very, very skilled rock climber. He was a pretty good alpine climber, but he didn't have a lot of experience climbing in adverse weather. And he thought the weather was going to be the same as last year. So it was not even in his realm of consciousness to perceive that those weather maps could have turned into what happened on the North Ridge when he got there. He would have been like, got up there and gone, where did this come from? And just wouldn't have had any kind of expectation that that was going to be the case. Uh, complacency um, normally happens with experts. We get super over familiar with stuff, so we get complacent. Okay, flying at Cario is possibly a place where we all go out and just get a little bit more relaxed sometimes. Hopefully not. Out of practice, that was me flying at Cario for the first time in three years last time. It was quite windy. 
we were having to use big ears to come in and top land, and I reached up and went like this and grabbed the two front A lines and went, fuck. <laughs> those, <laughs> those ones. <laughs> Um, What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I decided to go out and fly from the low side for the first time that I'd ever flown, to try and reduce the cognitive load of, of flying off the top of Moyers or, or even North Head because it's more complex. And I literally made a decision to go to the low side at Cario to reduce the complexity because I hadn't flown for three years. And I nearly, pulled, I nearly put a frontal in um, 40 metres above the low side landing. <laughs> I was like, no, no, it's those ones. <laughs> I didn't pull it. <laughs> I thought it would have looked pretty dumb. Um, distraction, talking about being distracted by chatting to your mates and setting up your GoPro on the launch and leaving your, um, your, your leg straps undone, um, flying for the first time in a pod harness um, or with a new GPS, so I'm distracted or I'm over, um, overloaded, so technology and gear. Scuba diving, we used to do that all the time. Used to dive with twin tanks on the back. A full size cylinder of 40% oxygen here and then 100% oxygen on a half size cylinder sitting there with a computer that switched behind it and, and all, a thousand regulators coming off all of the stuff and a dry suit into deep water with a wreck and low visibility. It's great fun. It's great fun. <laughs> so com complex stuff, so practice with your gear, know what it does, know how to use it, know how to do it in the dark those kinds of things, so gear, overconfidence. Um, decision deferral talks about not making decisions for myself but allowing other people to make decisions for me um, when their picture of the scenario and what's going on and their level of experience and all the rest of it is different to mine. Okay. Would so that, that be a continuation bias? Would that be one of those? Possibly known as consistency maybe, I'm not sure. So let's have a look. There is tons and tons of biases that um, are likely to affect us and I think Nearly all of these, the big groups, not necessarily the sub ones, affected Hiroki and Nicole and the rest of the other 14 people on that day. So the first one is called cognitive inertia or the consistency bias. And that's the tendency for the beliefs in our decisions to endure once they're formed. I've got a belief we're going on the mountain trip. The weather's the same as last year. We've paid our money. Um, I've told everyone we're going. Um, all of the previous trips I've been on have been great, let's go. With the commitment bias or the sunk cost fallacy, I've paid money, I've put cost into it, I need to go. I've walked up this hill. Yeah. I've driven all the way to Cario, it took me an hour and a half to get here, I'm not going to not fly. Okay? I'm going to buy another Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Because two, two Bitcoins is better than one, right? <laughs> um, with the acceptance bias, so that's seeking acceptance of our peers or saving face. So I'm standing next to my mate who's also driven an hour and a half um, to get to Cario, um, and he wants to fly, and I don't want to look like a dick, so we'll both fly. Okay. Confirmation bias is where we're tuned into information that co confirms our beliefs and we will discredit or not even become consciously aware of, so we miss the, sti the stimuli of evidence to the contrary of our belief. Okay? So there's the sensation and perception. So sensation is when the light hits your retina, and perception when it makes it all the way through the optical nerve into the cognitive brain. So the light is hitting our retina, but we're not, it's, we're not becoming conscious of it because something is blocking it, something mental, our belief in this case is blocking that out. And then goal-driven behavior is, is sort of a form of consistency as well, which is what you were talking about before around, um, so that's the summit fever, so that or destructive goal pursuit summit fever. I'm gonna get to the top of Everest, I don't care if I die. Um, in diving, it used to be called China fever. Has anyone heard the term China fever before? Wreck divers go after, um, after ins uh, plates with insignia on them, um, and they'll kill themselves going into wrecks trying to pull plates off. Another story, who knows where the Mikhail Lermontov is, anybody? What? Yeah. In the Marlborough Sounds, so the Russian cruise ship on the bottom in the Marlborough Sounds, everybody knows that's there. No, most people don't. 
It's a 20,000 ton Russian cruise liner, like the Love Boat from 1985, on the bottom of Marlborough Sounds. Mikhail Lermontov. Mikhail Lermontov. We were diving that, and I wanted something with, the, with a thing on it. And I'm over inside one of the bars, it's on its, it's, on its side. I've gone in through the glass windows, which would have been on the, the port side. They're all broken, you dive down. You're in the Bolshoi Lounge, it looks exactly like a scene out of the love boat with the ballroom floor and all these pedestal bars around it, but it's all sticking out on the side. And then you go over the bar into the middle, the horseshoe shaped bars that are there. And then you root around in the silt until you find bottles of liquor or, or plates or whatever is in there. Most of it's gone by this stage because other people have gone and got it, but I wanted something. And I'm looking at the, the blue light coming through these algae covered windows and I'm watching the silt cloud pour, start to pour out of the bar. I'm like, should I be here right now? <laughs> I do have a glass with more flot written on it. I'm pre <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. <laughs> China, that's China fever. There's heaps of, um, it's, it's the same as summit fever. It's like, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to not really kiss it the wrist. Familiarity is the weather thing that Hiroki did, past experience in guiding behavior in the current setting when the current setting doesn't match that. Okay. Um, with negative transfer, the wrong experience for a novel scenario. Every one of you, I guarantee, has had negative transfer before. Um, when you get in a European car, what do you do? When you go to turn left and right, you make the window wipers go. Okay. So that's negative transfer. So you go and grab the right hand stalk to go left and the wipers go. So you're applying a correct behavior for an incorrect setting, negative transfer. Okay. Um, and expectancy, our brains expect to see things that are consistent with our model, and so they actually do. Okay, so you'll, you'll start to perceive the things that are consistent. So it might be those clouds up are there and are, are not that bad because I know that the weather is the same as last year and we're fine, as opposed to going, oh shit, right, we need to get out of here. Now these are not conscious things. These are all happening at a sub-layer of consciousness. There's definitely things that we could talk about tonight that they could have done on that trip that would have categorically not allowed that thing to happen. And the only way that I can say that is because so many things happen and only one of them needed not happen for that not to have ended up in those two deaths. Um, like, let's have a talk, let's set a turn around time, let's put an alarm on a watch and when that goes off, we check the time, we look at the weather, we get the hell off the mountain. But in this case, they, didn't, they thought it was 12.30 and it was 4.30 and they hadn't talked about a turnaround time. <coughs> if it gets to 1 p.m. and we're not on the summit, we're coming back down the way, we're coming up. Who's happy to come back down the East Ridge summit if we have to come back down? You two have just done your snowcraft course and you've never been on Taranaki before, you've climbed, climbed Mount Ruapehu once, you've never done pitching, do you want to go do the North, do you, do you, do you want to be on the East Ridge or do you want to go do the North Ridge? That, because that's what they had. They had people who really probably should have gone the other direction. But there were two instructors. So I'll go with them, because they'll look after me. Social facilitation, we're more eager to, eager to perform and perform better with an audience uh, or risky shift, we agree. So it's actually group polarization. If the group has a tendency towards risky behavior, when you get in, sorry, people, when they get in a group, they'll polarize, they'll go more risky. If they've got a tendency to be risk averse, they'll get more risk averse. So if you're talking about a, a business team and, you're, and there's um, risk averseness and you put them together and it polarizes the other direction, that's bad for them too. In this case, we're talking about a risky shift so we're more likely to go, yeah, let's fly, when there's four of you standing on the side of the cliff than if it's just you on your own. When you're like, yeah, maybe not. I'm probably not going to fly today. The four is like, yeah, let's do it. You go first. Or in a competition. <laughs> Sorry? Or in a competition. So, co so competition is um, that adds the extra layer. Like if we're racing, um, there's another layer of, of this over. So I'm... Intentionally, you haven't talked about comps for a few reasons. Um, but so, so in fact, competitions do stuff better than some of our free flying because they have actual briefs and they have a safety committee 
and we have a system on the radio, and we try to destigmatize calling level one and level two and so forth. Um, whereas when we go flying on our own, we don't actually consciously go through those procedures, and there's arguments that we might try and we, maybe we should, or at least do better. Um, um, acceptance is the unwillingness to do something that the group's not going to like. So two or three of the people who came back down the East Ridge said they were cold, they were scared, um, they were worried about the weather, but they didn't want to say anything in case it made them look bad or weak or, or um, thought ill of. Um, There's a whole lot of this, a lot of this research came out of flight deck stuff when the co-pilot um, saw something happening um, but was either too afraid, either literally afraid or in awe of the captain sitting next to him um, going, well, if, it's, if, if they're okay with it, then who am I to speak up? Um, Tenerife Pan Am accident, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah that was the, that's the key example for sure. Um, scarcity. The value of the resource more if it's rare. First ascents, first tracks, summit windows. Flyable days. Absolutely. Making turn points or goal. You'll go um, I haven't flown and you got not quite that one, but yeah, want to get out there and, and do it. But if we perceive it as rare, um, I've, I've, you know. Speeding Ripley, start Ripley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never, I've never made it over that range before. What's the um over through um, what's the valley? You mean Woodcocks Road? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. What's the next valley north? Where you? Dome, Dome Valley. Yeah, you no. Know, something you're flying from Moyes. Like I've never made it over Dome Valley, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking like I might make it, so I'm going to push because I want to be able to tick that box. Okay, those are the kinds of things. Um, halo effect. This is where um, you judge someone else as because they're good at one thing, they're good at everything else. So Ripley's a good pilot, so therefore he's a good weatherman, so therefore he's a good decision maker, so therefore he's a good land, need to land now decider. Okay? Um, in, in their case, particularly the expert halo, the leaders are, the, those instructors know better than me. Um, so I don't, I don't need to question this. Um, and then there's a diffusion of responsibility, the, f the failure to take responsibility for something due to the expectation that somebody else will. Um, so the bystander effect has seen, more, uh, seen lots in accidents. There's a lot of research in, in like road accidents or other those type of accidents. If there's one person on the scene, they will act to help. And if there's four or five, they all just stand there and think someone else is going to do it. It's a, one, of the, one of the most well-documented psychological effects that there is, is the bystander effect. Another thing that um, aviators do really well is they verbalise their actions and their decision makings as they're going through them. Do you guys do that when you're flying? Do you verbalise, does anyone speak out loud about what they're doing? Hopefully with your PTO off. <laughs> with your PTO off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're in a crew environment or a group environment and you're verbalising your thinking, it allows others a window into your, into your, your soul or your brain. I mean, it's really useful, so verbalising decisions, you know. And then you're actually showing you're making them, you know. Um, I'm building the belay, I'm checking the knots, I've tied the back off, I've checked my harness, I'm clipping in, I've done my checks, I'm safe, I'm on belay. On belay. Climbing. Everything verbalised. Rock guys are quite good at that. Not the previous bits about tying in, but the um, on belay, um, climbing, off belay, clear. It's possible for us to create a, um, to create a, a, a not only a, a safety enhancing, but also an enjoyment enhancing and an esprit de corps enhancing kind of comrade feeling by doing this, where we bring everybody in to not only the decision but the activity um, so that we all get more out of it and, and those who are feeling more anxious or um, might have their fears allayed or might have their fears listened to and the plan changed and those sorts of things. So there's a lot of um, outcomes of this. We need to be careful that we don't all just sit on the ground forever. 
<laughs> um, and, we, and, and I think that's super valid. That's super valid. So what King said a little bit more than that. She said, you know, don't go be the party pooper when you really don't need to be because you are feeling anxious because you had a couple of beers and haven't slept well all week and maybe your skill level's not as good as them and, and, and their risk tolerance is higher than yours but you're both well within the risk window. So all of that is valid, right? So my question is, what do we do in order to make sure that the person taking off is taking off with system two engaged and not to system one? Like not just, or forget the systems, that they're actually consciously aware of all the parameters, um, that they've seen the same information that you've seen and they are, they are comfortable to fly in that situation and can verbalize, and even this might be too far, but just for argument's sake, they can verbalize, if not to you, but to themselves, that they're aware of all this stuff, and I am comfortable to fly, this is why. Um, as opposed to go, you know, letting them fly, and then they have an incident, and you're like, oh, I, I, I wasn't aware it was quite as cross as it was, and it's a new site, and I didn't know about that spur, and I, and I caught an eddy that I didn't know was here. And, and we were sitting up there going, I knew that was going to happen. Um, hindsight bias, but we've seen that, you know, that's the kind of subtle difference that we're talking about. Half of this can be pull, not push. Like your, your point about asking, the point about um, having deeper reflection, about thinking through things ourselves in a different way because we are aware, we are more aware of this stuff is, is equal if not more valid than making sure our mates don't go and do something stupid. Um, and our risk tolerances are, I mean, are all you know, completely different. Um, and what we're trying to achieve out of it too, it might be like, I'm gonna go and do the x help, so I need to be able to be comfortable pushing when most other people are not. Um, but I've also done all this preparation that you can't see, so don't judge me when I take off because I'm a different person from you. So it's fair enough. I go out and do risky stuff all the time. I was riding mountain bike two weeks ago, I'm 41. Three of us had not ridden for 10 years. We used to ride together lots in our 20s. One of us, who happened to also be the guy on the Coromandel receiving texts that have done everything except for flying with, including diving and climbing since we were 22. It was a groomsman at my wedding. He, he's been riding, he was super uber fit um, and really like psychomotor, like really physically gifted. Um, and we were zooming down the hill after that and we joked on the truck on the way down. You know, three of us are right in the zone um, for being those um, early 40s, haven't done a sport, back to it, complacent, overzealous idiots. Um, so I was being real careful and I rode ov over the jumps instead of jumping them and I went round and then I got more comfortable and confident as the day. So we're going there. But, um, but yeah, so why didn't they though? Why didn't they? A bystander effect. I mean, I, I mean it's... Who was going to start the conversation? Yeah. Cut, back, back up, back up, back up in time. Like a lot of in time. Like as in weeks and months and all the other trips that they've done. Because we don't do that around here. It's just not something we do, because that's the culture. Yeah, so um, Anand was just saying that if the climbers had it, so an, an if they had of is a, is, a, is a hindsight bias kind of line of thought, and they didn't, so that can't explain why they made the decision that they did if we're trying to work that out. So just to reinforce that. However, if we wanted to put something, if we wanted to learn from that and say, should we be carrying radios, what does it mean if we were carrying radios more often when we're flying? How would we use them? How would we still get past the bias of not wanting to be the, um, the, the party pooper um, who says we should go land because there's a kind of gray looking cloud over there. Is that cloud gray enough? Is it black enough? Is it big enough? Do I make the call? I don't know, I don't want to look at it. It doesn't solve that problem. But if I need to talk to you, it solves that problem. And Hiroki and Rowan were separated far enough that they couldn't have a discussion, a full discussion, um, and there was sort of a, a, a steep piece that they'd just climbed. So Rowan thought, I should go over there. And he's like, but I'm unclipped because I've been unclipped the whole um, afternoon because we didn't have enough gear. 
and that would mean I need to go take this gear, I need to put in an anchor, and then I need to move around to where Hiroki was as he's moving away, and that was too, that was too much effort, subconscious, like it's too hard, because I need to do all this, we're cold, we're already, we are already now very much tight for time and we're stuffed, I'm going. I believe Hiroki will, will work it out and make the decision and follow me down. Yet, but he didn't. And Rowan is like very upset with himself for not having made that system two level effort to go and do that. But that's only in hindsight that that was necessary. But you're right, could have, would have, should have, didn't. If there was a culture for asking more questions, if there was a culture for briefing, if there was a culture for X, Y, and Z, would that have changed it? I believe so. Yeah, that's in the recommendations for sure. Um, not quite in the level of intricacy and rationale and depth as what we would talk tonight, but the, 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 in the report it said they need to have a turnaround time um, and they need to have a what they called a pause point, which is where they, I believe it, where they would have gone, let's stop, let's consider, let's all kind of, like this kind of just stop everything, this kind of rush to get on the mountain or the rush to launch and just stop and bring everything into system two consciousness. Yes, they, that, those were the things they talked about. Because we can see these errors that that group of people made in hindsight as so clear and present, and because they were my mates. I mean, if I hadn't been in career, I could have well been with them. My best mate and one of my groomsmen um, has um, is, is since climbed Mount Cook and is very active alpine. He wasn't there. He was in the Coromandel with his family. He took a distress, distress call from Hiroki. Hiroki rang him up and said, this is the situation we're in. What do I do? He's standing at his dad's batch in Coromandel, and he's the one who's texting me as he was getting information from Rowan back in the, the hut. These, the, these were you guys and me out there doing something that we just do every day for fun. It was nothing more than that. So you're right. And so that's a lesson um, that, we, that this talk is aimed to, to try and, okay, so instead of going, oh, those poor or those stupid climbers, when you read it in the paper, going, what happened? Not only could this happen to me, is when will it? And how am I gonna make sure that the mistake that I make <laughs> um, fail safe so that when I make an error I'm not stuck in a waist high shell scrape bivy that I've dug with my helmet okay um, exposed from the waist up for 36 hours to one of the worst storms Taranaki's seen in 50 years um, I'm no another thing I mean they made a decision not to get off the mountain if you go and read the search and rescue textbooks, what did it say when you're, when you're lost and you're awaiting rescue? It says don't move. What should they have done? In hindsight, there I am doing hindsight bias with the should. What should they have done? At all costs, get lower on that mountain because it's too high and too cold. And yet they are using another consistency bias based on something that we all learn when we're scouts, when we're 10. Don't move. Yeah. I mean, less applicable to flying that one, but still. Um, what are some of the other things? We get lucky when we, make er when we commit errors all the time, which is kind of also the point. I'll tell you what happened. There was this piece on the way down where I actually was conscious of me feeling more confident than I had been when I set out that morning because I knew I hadn't ridden before. And I'm like, I'm, this is working well. I've got a new bike. Um, I'm this is going good and I probably, I actually don't think the place where I crashed was part of, the, it was a benign place that I crashed, which is even worse. <laughs> um, but this, just this level of just, 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 just. So when is the bit when you, so to your point, when's the bit when, what's the trigger for, for what would have been the trigger for me then? Where did this confidence suddenly, like you've been riding for an hour and a half and suddenly you're like twice as confident as you were this morning? Come on, your, your skills, you, you know, your, your practice has not got better in that time. You're still as much of a muppet as you were when you got out of the truck this morning. <laughs> Just not what, well, you're dead right. But I reflect on those things in, with this frame all the time. 
by, by noticing the, um, in hindsight, <laughs> usually, um, all of these sort of errors or traps or whatever having likely have occurred um, to me because this is the frame that I teach and live in and stuff. I mean, this is the same sort of stuff the special forces will do too, right? So these are, these are elite soldiers on the edge of their envelope. Just sort of to, to King's point, you know, every group to the right, you know, use this knowledge to the right thing, but don't let it stop, but be, stop you, but be aware of some of the stuff. And some of us, when we're mountain biking, should stop sooner than, you know, elite pilots or elite soldiers or, or elite person who have done the training, who have done the practice, who have, you know, much more conscious of what's, or much more unconsciously competent as they turn it on, practice, as they term it, practice, than perhaps we are. Certainly with aviation, it's about being current, for sure. What? I don't want to go scuba diving now, I'm scared of that. <laughs> just reflecting on the input from King and just before, because I'm like, we definitely don't want to have a culture of mansplaining or of ground sucking or any of those things. And I think I've even just, it's not about going up to the pilot about, the lo to about to launch and go, do you really want to or you should not. It's more about pulling it back and going, how do we, how do we bring consciousness and deliberateness to what we're about to do how do we openly discuss it by verbalizing our own thoughts or our own feelings and emotions about what's going on, um, about what the weather's doing, about what I'm trying to do, even if it's just between me and Johnny who are standing next to each other um, on the thing. It doesn't have to be the whole group, just, but how do we bring that deliberateness? How do we make it okay for other people to, to do that as well? And, and I'm not suggesting it's not okay now, I'm just saying how do we make it more okay or more deliberate? It would be how this, we didn't go through this, but you kind of talk through this model, right? It's plan what you do, do what you plan, but consistently, consciously monitor what's going on, and then when the data that's coming in suggests that you need to change your plan, then change the plan, right? So the weather, that weather is not what I'm expecting to see. Where does that come from? What does it mean? If I box on here, what, how am I gonna, Am I okay? Actually, yeah, I am. But I'm now conscious of that and I'm watching it more than I was before. It's got, you know, that rain showers. I think it's, I thought it was going that way and it looks like it's tracking that way. I'm going this way, so I'm okay. And then suddenly, oh no, it's coming to, you know, that level of, I mean, we do that with rain showers because they're clear and present, we see them. But, you know, as an example. Yeah, it's decision to drive, decision to fly, decision to launch, and then all of the decisions you're making continuously to go that way, to go that way, to carry on, to not land, to land, to whatever, yeah, for sure. But how do you bring a little bit more, knowing that if I just kind of drift, we're going to end up. Do you debrief your flights with anyone when you're training? Or, yeah, so, yeah. So depending on what we're training or flying for, I'm sure that aspect definitely will exist in our sport. I was going to say, what, what about, what did I expect to see? What did I actually see? What did the difference mean? Yeah. That's kind of something that we could, from this perspective, we could do. What did I expect to see? What did I actually see? What transpired? Why is there a delta? Can I explain it? Did that happened before, was that always going to happen? Could I have spotted that before I took off? Did it happen while I was in the air? How did I notice it? Was it dangerous? Did I consciously decide to continue once I was aware of it? Those are the sorts of good questions you could do within, within and of yourself, but also with others after a flight, for sure. I think that the fail safe or, or have you know, not terrible consequences when you make a mistake is important. And Examples of that is don't do acro low to the ground, or you know, but there's lots of ways where you can give yourself a backup if something goes wrong. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's actually quite a lot of our sport that does fail safe because we make the errors hundreds or thousands of feet in the air, um, and lots of times we're able to 
like the areas don't really end up in collapse. So let's talk about the, the two lessons and then continue this discussion to um, to so the, the two takeaways is forcing system two to help particularly for us because a lot of the time we're doing it we're individually fine and then all of the other group effects um, including if it's just a group of mates who are about to go and individually fly, is um, creating a shared mental model. Okay. So I, we'll think, see. I think something that could be brought into that is the same way for school, but there you have your body checks. Yep. Uh, on competitions, we have a very healthy model of um, safety committees and whatnot. Um, when we're flying with the group, getting into the habit of checking your mates. We used to do the, the, the back at home and uh, caught a few mates with the reserve ready to fall out or a connection twisted or something that they didn't get on their checks. Not by you checking on them to yeah. keep it from happening. Skydivers do it. Yeah. Buddy checks? Yeah, yeah dive, scuba divers do it too. And all we're going to do is plop into the water. Um, can got plenty of opportunity, much more opportunity to fix it than a skydiver does. But they do buddy checks too. Let me have a look. Um, do we do buddy? We don't do buddy checks when we're about to launch, do we? So all of the thing is, there's lots of things that we can do that would help, that we can put in, that we can consciously do, um, and create a culture or a practice or a rhythm or a routine or a habit or whatever you want to call it of getting into the the the. Um, the way of doing it different than what we do now. Um, and creating and, and removing any kind of perceived stigma of acting in that way. We're, I mean, we're all sitting here now going, let's just get rid of, we, we'll all be saying, I guarantee you're thinking of stigma, who cares? If I'm more than happy to hear from someone else if they think the weather's not good or, or if they're feeling anxious and they wanna, they wanna talk through why that might be because their gut's telling them something off that they don't normally tell, well, when you feel something in your gut, it's your body responding to the whole system of something's off here. My mental models that I've got from my experience and what I'm feeling, something's not right. Can we talk about what that is? Um, can we try and work out whether all you guys should go for, you know, that kind of thing, but do we put it in practice? How do we perceive it? What do we do? So the two things here anyway, shared mental model, this is what, um, Military and, and aviation use when they brief, they brief, military will brief before every evolution, what we call evolutions or activities. And the idea, one of the ideas is to make sure that every member of the team from all the different trades and branches and activities within what's going on is on the same page as to what everything needs to look like, go, no go, um, safety corks, um, all those kind of things. What is, you know, launching the helicopter off the, off the flight deck of the frigate was the best example when I was in the Navy and I, every time they were going flying, I would go and, and, and the psych <laughs> was at sea, which was a bit rare, um, but every time they were flying while I was at sea on a warship, I'd go and stand on the bridge and listen to the, um, the flying brief because it was an example of this. And so it was the captain, it was the flight deck officer, it was the pilot and the, and the attacker or observer from the helicopter, the crewman and the navigator, um, the person who was going to, the helicopter controller from the operations room, how everybody who was involved in that evolution was on the bridge of the ship and they went around each of their briefings as to what they were doing, why they were doing it, what to look out for and when to make calls when what they saw did not match what the shared mental model was building then, what the brief, if it was outside of the brief, speak up, let us know, because you will be the only person that's noticed, right? So that is what it, they're talking about as a shared mental model, okay? Brief and then debrief later again, make sure everybody knows the plan, discuss the goals and the incentives for mountain climbing. What are we here to do today? We're here to have fun, this is literally what they were there to do. We're here to have fun on the mountain um, and to consolidate some of the skills that some of you had on from the snowcraft course a couple of months ago. Um, we're going climbing. The summit is there, but we're not actually that interested in it. 
Um, who really wants to make the summit? Which way do you want to go? Isn't that just a risk perception that, okay, good fair enough, have two beers is slightly risky, but the outcome is going to be not as bad, but you know, if, if yeah, I have so one beer, then the outcome is far worse. Risk so it's kind of, kind of a, a risk. You're in your four wheel, you're in your four wheel drive SUV now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's at risk? The cyclist or you? <laughs> Cycles are drinking. Exactly. So, no, I think, I think, yeah, it's a risk. It's a level of risk tolerance. It's, I mean, let's not go that down the motorcycle rabbit hole either. But um, if you're lane splitting, for a last example, and I lane split, you know, you lane split at 20 k's an hour or 30 k's an hour faster the car, and then the, the squid on the on the sport bike comes up doing 50 or 60 or 70. Um, Speak, um, he's now fast in the car and you get out the way and he zooms up the middle and you go, well, his risk tolerance is a lot higher than mine. Well, you can see him easier because he's still got the old plate on as well. <laughs> <laughs> or his stupidity, or what, I don't know. But yeah, you're talking about risk tolerance um, and you're talking about um, how, so I talked at the start, how close you can get to the, to the edge before when you commit an error, it turns into an accident. And so if you're a jet pilot in the Air Force, back in the day, when we had them. You want the guys who are going to lane split at the maximum speed they can go, and maybe a slightly bit over, um, but without going too far that though. You know, you want them operating on that edge. But when we're flying, we don't need to be out of that edge. You pull it back. But how do you consciously, how do you even work that out? How do you do the calculation? Because the challenge here for us is, is you're saying, which is true, clearly, um, that all this is happening at a subconscious level. So we have to interrupt our subconscious, go into that system two stuff, amongst all our peers, like standing on the launch, right. at our various experience levels, and all this other stuff, and all these conflicting things, and we have actually, like you're saying, there's like compounding errors. We have to consciously stop the compound. Yeah. We, we have one moment that we're all trained to do that. And most people do it, maybe challenge or like that's our five point check. You know, we're all trained from day one, you will stop at this moment and you will carry out this check and do these five things. Mm. And it's the one time we actually consciously interrupt all of that and eagerness and all the other stuff that's going on and say, no, boom, do this now. And I don't know, I don't come across too many people who say no and never do it. Probably all of us have sometimes slipped up and not done it completely, but yeah, you know, and that's that's but, one moment that I get back to. That's the moment where we do it all. Formally. Yes, but do we respect that that's happening in our fellow pilot and not interrupt them if we don't realise it's happening? So there's what, what, you know, do we put a red light on the top of our helmet when we're doing our checks so that everybody knows we're doing our checks and no one interrupts us? No, we don't. So what I'm saying is that best intentions aren't good enough, if you know what I mean, to interrupt the chain unconscious. So, you know, I think that's valid. Yeah. I also think there could be a question like, how, how far does what is the what is the five point check for? And um, have we already made you know is there a decision to fly in the five point check, or have we already made that decision? And how have we reached the decision to fly? Um, so, what's in the five point check? What are the five points? <laughs> Please tell me we know what they are. Helmet. Helmet. Sorry. Yep. Wind. Attitude. Attitude. Is there, a, is there a decision to fly? Is there a decision? Should I be taking off at all? Is that it? Not just the immediate like there's traffic, there's no traffic. Not that bit. The actual decision to fly. Is that in the five point check? That is, that is the that is there is something. There is something. <laughs> well, you check, you check various factors that would go into that decision, like the weather, like the airspace, you know, everybody's flying in front of me, those sorts of things. Your equipment, that all goes into that decision. Yeah, you've already made the decision yeah. to fly by the time. I think you have. I think your consistency is taken over by this point. By the time you're clipped in and you're standing with your back to the cliff and you're you're like, my helmet's on, my legs have done up. There's no in my way. The winds are, you know, the weather, like the wind's straight up the hill. Um, I'm good to go. I think you're past. Should I be launching at all? I think you're past that. 
No, I disagree. So you, I, maybe you I shouldn't agree. be, but I think in practice, most people no, would be. Usually, you can be staying there, and your work can be bouncing up and down. Now, you still got an opportunity to kill the wings like that. Yeah, you do yeah, I agree with I agree with that in the um, in the like what the acute decision about the the wind and the weather right now, but all those other conditions about because I might just wait the winds bouncing around so I wait for a lull so I can get off safely because I've already made the decision to fly. Maybe. Maybe. It's a great it's a great question. This is a great debate to be having. I think for paragraph four, it's another actual what decision point as well. Just before you take your stuff out of the bag. You often sit around and look at the weather and go, am I actually going to fly? And I've been to carrier before, walked up the hill, walked back down the hill and left. <laughs> I, I, I think we all have walked away from a launch, definitely. The amount of time we've spent power waiting, <laughs> it's probably more than flying. That is a good um, decision for my point is, are you going to lay your wing out? Because that also, also requires an effort to pack it up again right, so if you're, you're not going to fly. So there's scarcity and consistency stuff once you're out. You're definitely going to glide down at least and I'm looking back down this hill. For me it's walking up. <laughs> All of us have a lot of blind spots when it comes to everything we do uh, and when we push the risk like we do in flying it helps to be conscious and deliberate of those so that we can make sure that we stay safe in the air.